how many times in our individual walk have we found ourselves weakened by our circumstances? And during those times, how many of us have cried out for help and seemingly our cries for help have gone unanswered? Okay, it's just me that's been alone in the wilderness. Because I can recall just on this past week feeling all alone and calling on some of my spiritual homies and them leaving me stranded, so it seemed. I'm not going to call any names or point any fingers or call anybody out, but somewhere in this section over here, <laughs> over this area here, I may have asked for some help. But anyway, you feel exiled, you feel abandoned, you feel desolate, broke, busted, disgusted, can't be trusted, and it's just not a healthy place. But just like I remember that, you don't like this mic. Just like I remember that, I remember God uh, having a ram in the bush and strategically placing some soldiers in the spirit to carry me when I lack the strength and the stamina to persevere. And even when I thought my, my infirmities were hidden or I had my game face on and everything was everything, they would pick me up in the spirit and be like, you know what, let me pray for you. You know, and God's soldiers are, are, are well equipped. They can assess the situation. They can discern the problem. And then they can seek God for the solution to the problem. They don't mind calling you out. And then they don't mind calling your name to God either. They don't mind interceding on your behalf. But then they don't mind giving you some act right too. Accountability works both ways. They're accountable to intercede for you and then they're accountable to make you go to God for yourself. God's soldiers are kingdom-minded and in tune with his purpose so that when something or someone is offline, they pick it up and they take it to God in prayer. Then there's the other option, which I don't particularly like too well. That's the one where God allows you to go through. It's nice to have someone interceding for you and having accountability partners, but it works even more for your good when God meets you at the point of your need. And instead of somebody leading you out, somebody pulling you out, somebody helping you out, you depend completely, totally, and solely on God for him to deliver you so you can just walk it out. There's a place of maturity that God desires to grow us to. We can't just get it by snapping our fingers, reading two scriptures, saying three hallelujahs. We got to grow to it. He planted in such a faith, but until faith meets the purpose he planted in there, we'll never walk in the destiny that he designed for us. So when your faith meets your purpose, it births you into your destiny. And when that happens, you can't go back to the way it used to be, and you can't stay in one spot where you are. You can't stay in a state of do nothing. Okay, I'm saved now. I know five scriptures, three hallelujahs, and I can speak in a tongue. Chickity, 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 hallelujah. I got it. There's always more. You have to grow forward. The days of coming to church hurt and leaving defeated, they end. That's over. The days of you coming to church, you pressing in, you getting yours from God, but two or three people on your row going home the way they came, that's over. You are responsible for everybody on your row. You need to look down your row right now. Look at every face on your row. You're accountable for every person on your road. If you see somebody who doesn't look right, they don't look happy, you need to find out if there's anything you can do. If it's nothing but smiling at them and saying, hey, I love you and God loves you too. That's your responsibility. That being said, let's 
go to camp. Second Kings chapter 7. Deke, if you can put that up on the screen for me. Second Kings chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God, and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. Now, first of all, Elisha came with the word of the Lord. He came with the word from God. I don't care if it's the pastor's number one armor bearer, if it's T.D. Jakes, if it's Juanita Bynum. If God told you something, you believe what God said and never mind what they said. This guy was a Lord, but he was not the Lord. He is discrediting what the Lord said based on nothing. At this time, the people of God are in the city. They've got famine. They've got nothing. They've got the Syrians outside the city. So they're being intimidated from the outside. They've got nothing on the inside. So even though he's the king's right-hand man, his advice really shouldn't be amounting to much of nothing anyway because they don't have anything based on what he's been advising thus far. The word of the Lord came from the man of God saying, by this time tomorrow, you're going to have provision. He's saying, unless there's a window in heaven, I don't see that happening. Now, I guess he didn't get the memo because my Bible says that God will open up a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing. I get that memo hadn't been written yet. I get that. But the Lord said that it was going to happen, so this is the word that you need to listen to. Okay. Thus far, his advice hadn't yielded any good returns. Famine's still in the land. People still starving. People dying. And then he's got the nerve to clown God. If you don't believe God, that's your prerogative. But don't hinder anybody else's faith. If they choose to believe God, let them believe God. You just shut up and go sit down somewhere. Verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Four lepers. Now, I don't know much about leprosy. I know that it's a, a disease where your body deteriorates and stuff falls off and you're not the whole person you used to be. But there's four of them and they're outside. At that time, they separated them from the rest of society. They couldn't be with everybody else. Now, being a leper, you're dying. You got stuff falling off. You're separated from your friends and family but you're still sticking close to them. Now, they in there starving and dying, and they're supposed to be whole. I got leprosy, and I'm outside, and I'm dying. Why do I have to be separated from you if we're all dying? Verse 4, if we say we will enter into the city, 